Very happy that uh, Jaume Gomez arrived from Perimeter Institute in spite of flight delays yesterday. And he will tell us about infrared dynamics of gauge theories. All right, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you much for the opportunity to give these lectures. So normally the title of my lectures is uh, infrared dynamics of gauge theories. This is a, like a very open-ended subject. So I guess the, what the organizers wanted me to discuss is, is um, I guess some progress that happened in the, in the last few years in understanding or at least giving concrete proposals for the infra infrared dynamics of various interesting QCD like gauge theories in three and four dimensions, sorry, in, in three and two dimensions. And also some interesting relations between QCD theories in two plus one dimensions and domain walls of QCD theories in, in three plus one dimensions. So that's where I, I will hope to get, but we'll get where, wherever we will. Now, one thing that I, especially in preparing for this lecture, one thing I, that you will notice in, in this kind of uh, arguments that we will discuss today is that it's, it's a little bit uh, like being a bit of a detective. You know, you have some evidence for this and that and the other, and you ha have to come up with some reasonable conclusion, okay? It's very hard to prove anything precisely, even though some statements I will make are, are completely rigorous, but it's very hard to make very sharp statements in, for some things. And even more so today, when I was, I was preparing for these lectures, there were certain things that I had never really thought about for, for myself in four dimensions. So at some points, I will literally be walking like in the line with no net in the bottom. So hopefully you will be in the net if I say something that's ridiculous. But hopefully, even if it's wrong, at least it, it will spark some, some discussion. Okay, so what is the role of a physicist, more or less? is to understand the low energy dynamics given, given a macroscopic Hamiltonian. So by that, I mean a set of short distance degrees of freedom and interactions. So I'll, I'll will represent this by this picture. So someone gives you a Hamiltonian in the UV. What, what UV means may be different for a particle physicist or for a condensed matter physicist. And now you want to know what happens in the infrared. Now, in general, uh, answering these questions is, is non-trivial because of uh, large quantum fluctuations. Or it can, be, it can be, if you can treat it, sometimes you can answer these questions using a perturbation theory. And I'm not saying that that's not interesting, but sometimes it's very hard just because you have large quantum fluctuations. The flip side of this that it's hard to, to answer is actually that it gives, because of, precisely because of the large quantum fluctuations, it can give rise to very interesting and surprising phenomena. So because of this, you can get very rich phenomena. It's not just a small decoration of a classical picture where you compute a small quantum effect you can get a radically new picture of the, of the physics in the infrared. So two examples that you know, and that actually will appear multiple times during these lectures. Uh, one is uh, QCD, where in the UV, you put in the, in the pressure cooker gluons and quarks, and in the infrared, you get uh, hadrons. So let's say this is massless QCD, you put some massless things and at long, long distance you get massive particles that have no color. That's kind of, uh, that's not something that my daughters would understand immediately that well, why is this happening? This is a non-trivial statement. Another one is a fractional quantum Hall effect where you know you, you have a piece of something and there are electrons, the electrons that we know and love and they have a Coulomb interaction and there are atoms and so on. So you, you put things that are very mundane but in infrared, you get, uh, you know, emergent gauge fields. Uh, 
and particles with anions, particles with fractional charge and fractional statistics. Okay. So these are just two examples of because of you have very large quantum fluctuations, you can get kind of very surprising things that look radically different from what you put in in the ultraviolet. As we will see actually in the studying QCDs in, in, in various setups, we will see that even though you put quarks and so on in the ultraviolet, we will find that in the infrared, sometimes you can get emergent gauge fields and anions in two plus one dimensions. Okay, so how do you do this? Too strong, too strong. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay. By the way, you should really stop me and ask questions. And if I don't know the answer, maybe someone else in the audience will know the answer. It will be more interesting for, at least for me, and not for you, but it will be better for me. Okay. So what is the most basic question that a low energy observer wants to know? If you're an experimentalist, the most important question you want to know in order to try to design an experiment that will detect the infrared phenomena is to know whether the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is gapped or gapless. Okay. So what does that mean? So you have a ground state, you can have multiple ground states, and you want to know whether the gap in the energy spectrum delta is V0, we say that the system is gapless. And if it's positive, we say that it's gapped. Now this, whether the system is gapped or gapless has dramatic consequences on the infrared dynamics, because essentially the gap determines the length scale of, of correlations, okay? So that's the basic thing, the first thing you would want to know. Uh, And we will see that in some cases, so in general, this is again very hard to, if you give me a Hamiltonian, this is a very hard problem to decide whether that Hamiltonian has a gap or gapless. And kind of part of the theme behind these lectures is to what extent can we say when we study, which we will study mainly QCD theories, what, what tools and techniques, and again, being a bit Sherlock Holmes, uh, can we use to decide whether a particular theory, QCD theory, is gapped or gapless? But of course, we want to know much more than that. So let me let me give a list of the kind of questions. Maybe if I can fit it here. So given a UV, so I'll just this is not an exhaustive exhaustive list, of course. We would like to know whether it's gapless or gapped. I already said that this is kind of the zeroth order question, if you're an experimenter that you would like to know. Now, if, this, if your Hamiltonian has a certain symmetry, let's call it G, and G could be a zero form symmetry, it could be a one form symmetry, it could be an, an invertible symmetry, it could be a two group, whatever. A much harder question to, as we will see, to answer than whether the system is gapped or gapless is whether this symmetry G, so G is the symmetry, global symmetry. You want to know whether it's unbroken, or spontaneously broken. Okay. I'll try, I'll, I'll write in capitals if possible. A, a related question, when the, 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 the notion of confinement is really sharply defined, you want to know whether the theory confines or deconfines. Um, okay, so now that, imagine you're answered this question, whether the system is gapped or gapless, you want to be more ambitious than that. You want to know actually what is the kind of infrared description of the system. So what we like to know is uh, the effective description. Is, it, is this big enough? Yeah. 
Actually, when I was watching lectures in the back, I couldn't see anything, so I sympathize. Yeah. Okay. So if the system is gapless, I mean, I'm, I'm here, I'm being there are caveats with this statement, but for, for now, I think this will suffice. Uh, if the system is gapless, the entire description will be some CFT, and I mean CFT in a generalized sense. And you would, you would like to know what, what this CFT is. Is it the Ising model? Is it the critical Ising model? Is it whatever? And here you have to be more careful. I'm using the language not to, not to, so you should distinguish two cases, whether it's an actual CFT when, when the symmetry G is preserved, is unbroken, or it could happen that uh, that CFT is actually a, a theory of Nambu Goldstone bosons when G is broken. Okay. Good. And then if the theory is gapped, what is the uh, under suitable conditions? What is the low energy effective description of a of a system that's gapped? And you, you may have to put some quali qualifications to show that this statement I'm going to make is essentially correct. Is described essentially by, by an object that, roughly speaking, since we're go going to the deep infrared limit, the correlation functions of local operators go to zero. So, in some sense, this theory has no local operators and lo no local dynamics, but, it, but other objects could survive the infrared limit. You could have Wilson lines or other. Uh, various co-dimension operators surviving the infrared. And such theories are, des are described by topological quantum filters. So you may want to know, imagine someone tells you that a particular theory in two plus one dimensions is gap. Your task would be to identify which topological field theory this is. Okay. So the classes of theories that you get in the infrared is extremely rich. Well, you know, I'm sure a lot about symmetry breaking and conformal field theories, you, you know that the space of those theories is, is quite large, especially in lower dimension. And there are many, many topological quantum field theories that you've studied, in particular in two plus one dimensions. So you would want to identify which one uh, describes your particular infrared dynamics of the Hamiltonian. Whenever this, this, this notion makes sense and it's kind of an ambiguous, you would like to understand the operator mapping. So if I give you some operator O U V in the U V Hamiltonian, you want to know whether this operator decoupled so that the low energy observer does not know about it, or actually it's, it, it's an operator in the infrared. So this operator could be an operator in the infrared of either the infrared CFT or the infrared TQFT. Okay. And finally, you could ask something more ambitious. You could ask, if you are able to answer this question, you could ask, what is the infrared dynamics of the following perturbed Hamiltonian? You start with the Hamiltonian that you started with, and now you deform by a particular operator in the UV. You may want to ask what happens now in the infrared, okay? And depending how quickly I go in these lectures, we will see aspects of all of these questions addressed in various degrees, depending on the dimension of space time. Okay. Okay, so for this, I need to plug by its own. So, what are the theories? So, these are generalities. Next time I'll push further. Okay, so what are the theories? In this lecture, we're going to discuss. It, it, it's very scheme dependent, but you may have other symmetries that allow you to kind of choose a rather precise uh, mapping. But in general, yeah, I mean, any operator can mix with the identity, right? So it's, it's, it's a subtle question. But we'll see, I mean, in, in, in several examples, you can make a rather sharp statement about what, what the mapping is. So in this theory, we will discuss 
the topic of this of the school, which is QCD. So let me define what I mean by QCD in D space time dimensions. And these are, I will mean Young Mills theory with, with gauge group G. Oh, I'm, I'm drawing too small again. Is that okay? I'll try to do it bigger. Plus fermions, which I'll sometimes defer as quarks. In a representation R of G. Okay. So that's that's what I will discuss. And the goal would be to be able to answer as many of these questions as you can given such a theory. Okay. And we're gonna okay, and we're gonna do this in theories for which infrared dynamics of QCD. Uh, is, is non-trivial. So that means that we're gonna study these theories for D less or equal than four. Okay. So I know this is like 20th century, but I have a, a way of thinking, but I'll, I'll write the Lagrangian or what, what the theory I'm discussing. So we're gonna have the, the usual Young-Mills term. So here, okay, we already have to discuss some certain things here. So this is a Lagrangian of just uh, uh, the gate field and the, and, and the quarks. Already here, we have to be careful if we're gonna discuss things in, in general dimensions. Uh, so let me make a small parenthesis here. Um, so if, if you are in four dimensions, Since uh, complex conjugation flips chirality, you can always write down any gauge theory using uh, left uh, chiral fermions, okay? So the basic quark here will be a basic with a wild fermion. So I'll choose a, a left moving wild fermion this, you know, the, this annoying spinner notation. And we're gonna have to pick a representation R of G that can be reducible, okay? They can be a direct sum of many things. And this guy is complex, that's very important. In three dimensions, the basic object is actually Majorana fermion. In some sense real, well, in a very definite sense real. And like this, 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 this will have important consequences soon when we discuss uh, many things. But uh, and then in two dimensions, the, the minimal spinner. So in two dimensions, there is something funny that happens. So of course you have wild fermions in two dimensions. Uh, and actually, you can impose stronger. You can impose Majorana and wild Lorentzian signature. So in some sense, you have. Say left and say right. But unlike in four dimensions where complex conjugation flips chirality, since the chirality metric in two dimensions has no I. So in four dimensions, so in 4D, I can using this notation from which I, I borrowed from Van Proyen and Friedman, which is very useful. This is the chirality matrix in any given dimension. Of course, even dimension. So in four dimensions, you have this, this I there, so that the, the thing squares to plus one. That, 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 that does what I said, so that under complex conjugation, the chirality of the fermion is flipped. That's not true in two dimensions. So the most general QCD theory in two dimensions actually is, is labeled by a pair of representations. The representation of the left moving quarks and the representation of the right moving quarks. Okay. Any questions about this? This should be fairly elementary. Okay, are there other terms that we can write down here? Yes. 
you can write down a theta term. And this can be either, okay, so now here I have to. So L theta can be uh, continuous. A continuous theta angle. So in four dimension, be something like theta over eight pi square raised f with f in in d equals four, and in d equals two will be theta over two pi raised f. Or if it could be discrete. So for example, if g is not simply connected. Like for example, if you, if you look at theories with gauge group SO3, then the theory can be endowed with what are called discrete theta angles that essentially when you sum in your partition function over the gauge fields, there are certain bundles of SO3 that do not come from bundles from SO, from, of SU2. So this allows you to add, add these discrete parameters. Uh, I'm not sure it's a more down to earth way, but another way to think about it is that the way you can construct the state angles is that SO3, I can just relate, I guess, to things you've heard from, from Nati. So SO3 is SU2 mod G2. So what you can do is you, you take the SU2 theory, which has a Z2 uh, one form symmetry, and then you get that one form symmetry. When that, of course, you can only do that if that Z for one, one form symmetry does not have a, a tooth anomaly. And then the various churches of theta angles correspond to, in the process of gauging, you can attach, you can uh, tensor your theory with uh, what's called an SPT phase or a, topo a trivial, uh, a, theory, a theory with essentially no dynamics. And when you do the gauging, which is essentially summing, summing over these Z, uh, Z2 one from gauge fields, those choices are these churches of theta angles. And these things play an important role in various contexts. And then you could add other things, we'll call it L extra. So this could be things like, okay, one thing that will be very important for us, if you are in three dimensions, we can add to the Young-Mills action, chern simons term. Something like K over four pi, trace ADA plus two thirds A cube. And K has to be properly quantized. So this is an extra coupling that you are, is available to you in, 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 in three dimensions that's not available to you in two or four dimensions. And the dynamics of the theory as we will see depends very, can depend very sensitively on K, okay? Good. And then you could add uh, for any dimension mass terms, if you can write them down. If you're in lower dimension, you may be, may be able to add four Fermi operators and study the energy flow of those and so on. Okay, good. Very good. I should mention that, so here I added this theta parameter. And here I added a mass term for the quark. Because of chiral symmetry, these two parameters are not, are not really independent. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm adding a redundant description of the parameters of the theory when you add a mass term and a theta term. Okay. Uh, so one useful way to think about QCD for many purposes is, uh, is that we can think of this theory as obtained by gauging uh, a subgroup G of uh, the free quarks in 
in the ultraviolet. So if you take any of these theories that are infrared free, so in two, in two and three dimensions, essentially there is no restriction. Dimensional analysis always wins. Any matter content or any gauge group will, will flow to a strong coupling in infrared. And in four dimensions, since we want something interesting in the infrared, we're gonna consider asymptotically free theories. For those theories, if you look at the deep UV, essentially you only have a system of free quarks. And now you can just uh, try to gauge a subgroup of that, okay? And then in this way of thinking, one way to think about it is that the gauge coupling triggers energy flow. Like in that picture I wrote somewhere there. And we want to know what happens in the infrared, okay? Now, uh, something that can happen and it does happen is that in this way of thinking about it is that there could be an obstruction to gauging. So some of them you, you know. So one obstruction is uh, what's called the perturbative of local anomalies. So these are obstructions to gating that you can discover by looking at the correlation functions of the currents of the G symmetry. And if there is an obstruction to, to gating that symmetry, well, that, that theory doesn't make sense. Okay, so we, we don't discuss it. So that, that, that's, and that's the idea of an anomaly cancellation. Yes. No, it has much bigger global symmetry. Okay, so. No, no, I mean, you get, okay. Subgroup G of the free quark uh, flavor symmetry. So what you do, you have a quarks in the UV that will have a flavor symmetry G UV. And what you try to do is you try to get a subgroup of that. So for example, if, I, if you have, uh, okay, so imagine you study Young males with an adjoint fermion. Okay, no, no, let's, let's say, uh, yeah, with an adjoint fermion. So, what would be the GUV symmetry in that case in four dimensions? No. How many fermions do you have in the deep ultraviolet of that theory? Are we in minus one? N for minus one. So, so what you do is you get, uh, if you're doing SUN, an SUN subgroup of that. But you have to make sure that you can gauge it, that th there are no anomalies for it. Okay. And actually, the issue of what is the symmetry in the deep ultraviolet actually depends quite sensitively because of what I said here on the space-time dimension. For example, in four space-time dimensions, the quarks are complex. So the natural symmetry that you're gonna get in the UV is naturally a U M, M, let's call it M, not to confuse with the rank, U M flavor symmetry, where M is the total number of quarks. Essentially, it's the dimension of the representation in the gauge theory. But in two and three dimensions, since the minimal spin, spinner is Majorana, the, U, the, the UV symmetry that you will have to embed your gauge group into is, O-N, O-M, sorry. Because uh, free fermions, uh, sorry, real fermions are rotated by an O-M o -M symmetry. Okay. Yeah, so you have, how many quarks do you have? So you're, you're doing SU3 with three flavors? Yes. Yeah. So how many quarks do you have? Three, three, three. Nine. Ah, okay, so it's quarks and... and... Oh, okay. so you have to count all, yeah, so you have uh, three direct, you have to count them properly. So I'm always counting while, so you have to multiply by a factor of two. And then you get the, the anomaly free subgroup. 
I mean, that's a general story. Whenever you have a gauge theory, before it was a gauge theory, there was a global symmetry and you gauged it. That's a useful perspective. That's not how usually tech would say it, but I think that's a useful way to think about it. Okay, so this is the anomaly that you all know, for example, in four dimensions is the, the famous triangle anomaly. So you insert a G current here. An anomaly cancellation is the statement that the anomaly polynomial, sorry, that, so in order to get an anomaly, first of all, you need a cubic invariant because you're looking at the three point function of the currents. And the cubic invariant should be uh, symmetric. And from that, you can define this, this scalar quantity, which essentially tells you the contribution to the anomaly for a given representation R. An anomaly cancellation is a statement that this should vanish. Okay. So, for example, that in four dimensions, actually, it turns out that this condition in four dimensions is relatively weak, say, compared to two dimensions where essentially any, any quark in any representation has a non-zero analog of this quantity. In four dimensions, the only quarks and get, the only theories in which you have a potential anomaly is if G is as you n, okay? And R is a complex representation. Any other representation of SUN or any other gauge group or any representation is automatically anomaly free. That's definitely not the case in two dimensions. I'll, I'll, hopefully, we'll discuss two dimensions at some other point, but yeah. So, these, these are presumably things that you know well. If not, I can elaborate more, but uh, I think you're familiar with the triangle anomaly. Okay. So, this is an obstruction that you know. Another important anomaly is what's called uh, the global anomaly. So that's the only, that this is not the only obstruction for this gauging to, to be successful. There's a much more subtle anomaly called the global anomaly that cannot be seen just by studying correlation functions of currents, okay? In order to detect it, one way of saying it is that you have to study, you have to couple the theory to non-trivial background gauge fields, okay? And uh, so this was discovered by Witten. Okay, so I, I could go deeper into this, but uh, I probably shouldn't. But just to give an example of the kind of restrictions that it gives you, it tells you that, for example, if you take the gauge group to be SU2, and you take a quark R, in, in a representation uh, which has, okay, I'm gonna sit in spin or dimension. Okay, R with spin. Let's call it J, which is 2L plus a half with an odd number. Okay, with, let's say with one quark in this, with this spin, then this theory is inconsistent. So in a sense, the simplest thing you could ever think of, as you do with a quark in the two-dimensional representation, the fundamental representation, this is inconsistent. So a spin a half is inconsistent, a spin three halves is consistent, a spin five halves is inconsistent, okay? Of course, it's not inconsistent if you have two copies of this guy. Actually, that's not totally obvious, but yeah, you can prove very simply that if you have an even number of them, then, it, then it's fine. So this is a nice example of something that, you know, if you were a simple-minded person like I am and you write it down this theory, you would, you would think that this theory makes sense, but actually there's an obstruction to, to gauging this symmetry. And I should say that this, this kind of global, global anomalies for continuous uh, gauging of gauge groups uh, only exist in, uh, in four dimensions. They're not there in two or three dimensions. Good, just in, in case you wanna look at the literature, you could ask what is the most general gauge group and matter content that gives rise to 
a, a global anomaly? The answer is that is that gauge group SP, SPN, hopefully you know what this is. And R essentially is a representation such that if you count the number, if you compute the number of uh, fermion zero modes in, the, in an instanton background, the number of zero modes is odd. Okay. And that has to do with the, what's called the Dinkin index, which we'll come back to. The it's measured essentially parameterized by the Dinkin index of the representation mod two. If, if, the, if the Dinkin index is odd number, then the theory has an anomaly. If it's an even number, it's anomaly free. Can be gauged. Okay. So now we, we have a kind of a perspective on how to construct these theories. And now we want to try to answer th these questions, okay? So let's start with a case example, which is the most relevant one for the real world. So let's try to summar okay, uh, summarize what the phase diagram is. For massless QCD. So let's look at massless QCD. So as you n with NF wild fermions in the fun fundamental plus anti fundamental. Or if you if you prefer more that language, NF direct fermions in the fundamental. So here is the, the, the phase there. I should say that very little of what I'm going to write down here is actually proven or known. Some of it you, you, you can prove, but so this phase diagram has emerged uh, by a combination of theoretical ideas, experiments, which means uh, actual experiments and numerical experiments and, and, and guesswork. Okay? And that's kind of the nature of the subject. Okay, but let me tell you what, what we believe to be known. So in this axis, I'm going to write down an F, the number of flavors. Now let's start. You should always start doing things where you're sure that what you're doing is correct. But usually a good lesson in life in general, but especially useful here. Oh, fourth dimension, sorry. When I say the real world, I really meant uh, like Christian before, yes. So you all know the, that the gets at one loop, the, you have a running of the coupling. Okay. And essentially, you know that, and this guy for, for QCD, uh, I'm right here, it's 11 thirds N minus two thirds N F. So one thing that you know from here is that if you take NF to be too big, then the, the theory stops being asymptotically free. The opposite of asymptotically free is infrared free. And so that theory is gapless. Essentially, it's a, it's a glorified QD theory. In the, in the, at long distances, you get massless uh, quarks and gluons. So this estimate is very reliable because you can just compute it in perturbation theory. And that happens at 11 half n. So here the theory is gapless and boring in some, in some sense. Sorry? Sorry? No, the thirds cancel? Yeah. Okay. Now, what else can we say? So here we, we, are, we are comfortable. We can trust uh, Jungle's perturbation theory. Now, one game that you can play is to say, okay, let me look at the beta function at, at two loops, which is anyway at, at the number of loops in which the, the beta function is a scheme independent. And some heroic people computed that beta one. I'm not gonna ask you to do that as an exercise. Actually, I've never done it myself, so it wouldn't be fair. <laughs> and then something that you can do is the following. You're still trying to be reliable. You can play the same game that you have played and people played when the, the people did the epsilon expansion. What you try to do is to try to find the zero of the beta function by canceling this term with this term. So here, 
the living term is, is a negative because you're in a sympathetically free domain. In, uh, in the Wilson Fisher, that happened by going to four minus epsilon dimension. So this is a bit slightly more reasonable. And then you have this beta one that can be positive or negative. But what you can do is, uh, in particular, you can study the theory in a large n, large nf limit in such a way that you can get a fixed point, a zero, You can get a zero that's parametrically small. You can tune n f and n so that it's very, very small. And then what do you have? What's the, what happens when you have a zero of the beta function? You have a CFT. This is the bank Zach, yes. So you know that in this region here, reliably, you have a CFT. So you have G, oh, okay. One thing I should have said, okay, let's discuss let me step back. Let me discuss a few of the symmetries of this theory. The, the ones, I mean, there are many symmetries, but let me discuss the ones that will be important. So this theory has an SUNF times SUNF. Yeah, usually people call it left and right, but since I, put, I wrote everything in left, I don't know how to write it, but I'll use the same notation, it's left and right. And you have also U1 variant symmetry. This is a vector-like symmetry. Actually, there are some discrete symmetries and discrete quotients that I'm not going to discuss un unless they're very relevant. They're not relevant right now. So, so this CFT, so let's call this, uh, oh, I shouldn't call it G, I should just call it GF, I guess. Let me call it GF. So this is the flavor symmetry, the continuous flavor symmetry of this theory. So in the bank Zach, this G, so in, in this domain, what you have is that G is unbroken. And the theory is gapless. And actually, it's a CFT. OK. But of course, uh, as you move away from here, you, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, there is no controlled e expansion anymore. So now let's start from the other end. So you can start at nf equals 0. By the way, here I'm putting the theta angle. OK, since I'm looking at massless quarks, the theta angle has no, no meaning. You can rotate it away by a chiral rotation. At an f equals zero, you just have uh, usual, I mean, conventional Young Mills theory. And again, by a series of uh, experiments, uh, theoretical and, uh, and experimental, we believe that this theory uh, is, is uh, gapped. And it's trivially gapped. So you have a unique vacuum, and uh, there's nothing there. There is no T. Or another way of saying it, it has a, the trivial TQFT. That's one way of saying it. Okay. That's true for theta equals zero. That's the best thing I was trying to say. That theta is min, no, not meaningful anywhere else in this diagram except that nf equals zero, where it is becomes meaningful. So, so there is a trivially gap vacuum for any value of theta except for theta equals pi, which you can have two vacua. Okay. So now what's the picture? So that now the rest is. Well, of course, this is, this is also conjectural. I mean, no, no one has proven that, but uh, we believe this to be true. So what's the other, what, what do we expect from the other part of the diagram? So what we know is that what's expected is that there is a lower bound here that we'll call NCFT, through which essentially the, the bank's Zach's fixed point extends over to. So in this domain, the, these properties are true. You have a CFT, which is, with G is unbroken. Now, what happens when you cross to this to this side? So here, again, this is an experiment. This could not have been the only answer, but uh, this is what is believed to happen in this actual theory. So one thing that you can prove, and actually uh, and Buffer Witten did prove, is that all vector-like symmetries in this theory cannot be spontaneously broken. Okay, I'm not going to prove this, but it is a statement that I mean, you're familiar that in, when you have a strong coupling, some symmetries can be spontaneously broken. But one thing that we know rigorously know is that the diagonal SUNF times the variant symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken. There is no statement about the others one that they could or could not be broken. That, that is a dynamical statement, we don't know. So what believes that, that happens is, is because you have pions in the world and so on and so forth, is that um, the system in this window 
Okay, and this goes all the way down to NF equals two. So in this interval, the theory is believed to be gapless. GF is broken to the thing that it could, it couldn't, the, ma the maximal breaking that you could have, which is to SUNF diagonal times G1 variant. And this is described not by a CFT, by the, by, by the theory of Nambu Wollstone bosons. Nambu Wollstone bosons. Massless, massless. I, I wrote massless here. Yeah. You can now add masses, and then you could ask how this masses affect some of these statements. In the, for example, in the chiral Lagrangian, and people have studied that extensively. Yeah. There are no subgroup times variant number because that, that cannot be broken. And uh, in the app, yeah. For? Yes, yes. So you have to be. What, what happens in that region where, where I have theta minus two here? Well, the, the argument breaks down. I mean, the, the, the argument essentially depends crucially on the measure being positive semi definite. The theta angle has an I and that screws you over. Yeah. Okay. And now there is a, actually a, a, a weird theory that has NF, which is NF equals one. We could, we could discuss it. I mean, I'll just say a couple of things. Now, this theory is kind of peculiar. The continuous flavor symmetries are only the, the U1 baryon symmetry. And actually, that, that's a peculiar case in which the theory with a massive quark or massless quark have the same symmetry. Okay. And here, what believes to happen is actually that the theory is gap with a unique vacuum, okay? So some of it follows a, like a very semi-classical intuitive picture. The more fermions you add, the less negative the beta function is. So the more reasonable it is that if you started with something gapless, you end up with something gapless, okay? That's kind of a, a very shaky rule of thumb, but it, it's approximately correct. As the number of, as the, beta, as the number of flavors or as the beta function becomes more and more negative, there is a chance that you will be gapped because the theory is more, more strongly interacting in some sense and this weird phenomenon of developing a mass gap could, could, could occur. Okay, so this is, oh. So now I want to ask is what can we say about a general QCD theory. So, I'm probably going super slow, but it's like, uh, so first of all, I should say that, of course, we, we don't know. I mean, we don't know even for uh, the mother of all theories, okay? So whatever I'm going to say, there is no experiment. For many of them, you cannot do a lattice simulation. So this will all be a little bit of, um, as I said, detective work a little bit. But, but there, there will be some, sorry? Well, it's, belie it's believed that uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of the chiral symmetries happens all the way to NF equals two. That we believe that you, we, we believe that the SUNF symmetries, you have two massless uh, flavors. Mm -hmm. We believe that symmetry sp breaks spontaneously. Could also be yeah, no, I, I mean, but NF is the, is the lower bound. It's from NF equals two to NF and. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the lower bound. Yeah, okay. You, if, if that was not clear, I'm very depressed. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they were supposed to be the an axis, and that's the lower boundary, and that's the upper. Yeah. Is that related to using the Kuchak model? No, 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 nothing at all. No.
Okay. So, so now what, what, I, what I'll, I will do is to try to see how tooth anomalies for continuous symmetries allows us to prove that certain theories must be gutless. We, we still do not know, we'll, we, we'll, this will not tell us whether the, the symmetry is spontaneously broken or is unbroken, but at least we will we'll be able to answer the first question, okay? So let me discuss, I, I, I know you've had lectures from Nati about this, so I, I will be rather minimal. Okay, so given a, a global symmetry G, I mean, I already said that essentially, there can be an obstruction to gauging, okay? And that, uh, let's call it a tooth anomaly. If it... Now, th these tooth anomalies are classified. I'm saying statements that you've heard before. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. Admit a topological classification. Which means that they, they can be through the physics of anomaly inflow, which I'm sure you've seen in your courses. The anomaly for any symmetry, actually continuous or discrete, can be thought of as this being described by a topological field theory in one higher dimension. Okay. So the fact that they admit a topological classification, this, the, you can think of your field theory that has a tooth anomaly living at the, at the boundary of some topological field theory. Now in, the, in, the, in, in, your, further, in your whatever, in your physical theory, you can have an RG flow. The topological theory doesn't know about length scales or anything. So the, thing, the reason that these uh, tooth anomalies are very powerful is that precisely because the anomaly is, is kind of topological, let's call this a, is that uh, the anomaly is invariant under RG flow. So it's an RG invariant. Okay. So it, it constrains the dynamics of the, of the system. If you, if you are able to determine that you have a, a your Hamiltonian the UV has a certain global symmetry and that it has a tooth anomaly, you can already conclude something very strong from it. You already conclude that the theory cannot be trivial and gap because the trivial theory has no tooth anomalies by, by definition. Okay. So this is very powerful. I mean, we, we don't know what we're talking about many times, but if, if you're clever enough to discover a symmetry and, anom and, and it has an anomaly, you can conclude at least that it cannot be a trivial theory. Like what happened, for example, for Young Mills for an F equals zero. That theory, at least when the, the gauge group is simply connected, is, is believed to be tri a trivial and gap. Okay, so now let, let me tell you a few things that hopefully some of them are to a certain degree familiar. Let me discuss a tooth anomalies for flavor symmetries. So the goal here is to, I mean, this kind of analysis is to try to narrow down which theories are potentially gap, okay? Um, so just to be concrete, I mean, you, you could do this analysis also in two dimensions, but let's do it in four dimensions. So we consider a four dimensional QCD with a while, with a, a chiral fermion in a representation fancy R, let's say it's a sum of these things. You have N alpha copies of representation alpha, okay? Now, we said that we want this theory to be strongly coupled in the infrared. So we want it non-trivial in the IR. So that means that G should not have U1 factors. And um, 
is we, we should choose G and the representation R such that it's asymptotically free, okay? So in, in particular, that this beta zero I described earlier is that notation is positive, okay? And you can go through an exercise of trying to understand, given a gauge group G, what representations are asymptotically free. Uh, for the classical groups, like as you and so and SPN, the the theory is that kind of universally, as you go for any value of n, uh, asymptotically free, is that if you choose R to be the adjoint. I'm going to use this notation, which is not okay. Rank two antisymmetric and rank two symmetric. This theory for any value of n is asymptotically free. If finally, if you take rank three, it may be asymptotically free for a small value of n, but not for a large enough value of n, just simply because the contribution to the beta function grows too fast and overwhelms the, the negative contribution of the gluons. Good. So now let's do. Do some gymnastics. Sorry? What happens to what is the beta function of a theory with a U1? Sorry? What is the beta function of a theory with a U1 factor? Yeah, so it's boring and infrared. Well, uh, Yes, I mean, you, you could die, but it kind of decouples in. I'm, I'm just not considering them, yeah. Yes. That's a global symmetry. Yeah, we should never mix global symmetry, yes. Okay. So as I said, we want, uh, you want to say this? I already said that, okay. So I already said that, uh, sorry, so let's look at the flavor symmetry. We already discussed that we have to make sure that there is no obstruction to gauging uh, G, okay? So that G is the, the so you get a, a theory with that, that will all, all gauge anomalies cancel. Okay. Um, so now it will be sufficient for the argument I want to make to consider R. To cons so here I was picking the more general thing, but let, let's just pick one factor, okay? So have NF copies of some given representation R, okay? Now, what is the flavor symmetry that rotates this quark? Can someone tell me? Well, U and F. Let me work that. Yeah. You have U and F. So classically, you have a U and F symmetry. But actually, there's something called the ABG anomaly, which presumably you, you have seen. Where the U the U1 factor is broken to a, a discrete subgroup, which is Z times twice the Dinkin index of the representation. And this Dinkin index is something that you know very well from Feynman diagram. So whenever you have a fermion loop and you have a fermion in a representation R, this gives you something that's the trace of TAR, TBR. And this defines the Dinkin index. Okay. Good. Now, now the discrete factor will not be important right now, but uh, it will be important later. And the ABG anomaly comes from uh, the following triangle. So we already discussed gauge anomaly. So it comes from the GGG triangle. The ABG anomaly comes from, uh, so let's call this guy GF. Sorry. Uh, the UNC, let's call this guy GF, say. This comes from this kind of anomaly, okay? The gauging of G explicitly breaks. You misidentified your symmetry. You thought it was a U1, but actually you were wrong. 
it's broken to this pizza group. Is there something that people know about or not? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is way too fancy for what I'm saying, but yes. Such things can happen, yes. Uh, the argument I'm going to make is just for very vanilla continuous flavor symmetries. So now that the statement is that, uh, oh, yeah. So now let's look at the SUNF tooth anomalies. So this comes from a triangle where you have SUNF, SUNF, and SUNF. Uh, okay, just related to this. Okay. So now, just the, the same way. Um, so now, now I'm confused about something, sorry. Uh, no, no. Anyway. Uh, so, th so th there is an anomaly because there's, for S, U, and F, there is a cubic invariant, okay? So th this is non zero. Okay. So what we've learned is that in this, uh, if, if, if your theory has a, a, has a multiplicity in the, in the number of flavors, there is a, tooth, a an anomaly for the continuous flavor symmetry. Now, what does this tell us about the theory? Uh, what, how many minutes do I have, Igor? Twelve, okay. Let's see how much I can get done. So, as, so this is a general discussion. So if the system has a tooth anomaly, then several things can ha happen. So there is a tooth anomaly. You can make kind of the general statements. If the, if the, if the symmetry is continuous, so as I said before, the, the tooth anomaly is, is an RG invariant. So it should be, there should be something non-trivial in the infrared that, that saturates it. So there are two things that can happen. You can go to a symmetry preserving. Okay, so I, 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 I should say something about that, yeah. So the, the, the first statement that, that I want to make is that if a, if a system has a continuous symmetry with a tooth anomaly, that system cannot flow to a gap theory. It's, it flows necessarily to a gapless theory. So this can be made rigorous, but the, the basic physical intuition is that uh, the existence of a tooth anomaly for the fl continuous flavor symmetry means that you have correlation functions of currents that have support at separated points, okay? And that kind of singularity can never be produced by a, by a gapped system. So you know that in a theory that has a, a, a tooth anomaly for a continuous flavor symmetry should be gapless. This is extremely powerful because as you see, discovering uh, tooth anomalies for, for the symmetry, is, is, it was trivial essentially, right? But you know, if I give you the Hamiltonian of a theory that with this flavor symmetry and you were not thinking very carefully, it would be hard to determine whether it was gapped or gapless. And there are two things that can happen. It can, it can flow to a CFT where G is unbroken. or you can have uh, a spontaneous symmetry breaking. So Goldstone boson. Okay, uh, I, was I was trying to, to tell you the logic without writing equations. Uh, okay, so the logic is that 
what is the anomaly? The anomaly comes from looking at certain uh, conservation current violation. That conservation current violation comes from a certain two, or, uh, this depends on the dimension, two or three point function, say two point function in two dimensions, four point function in uh, three point function in four dimensions. The anomaly equation essentially gives you a, an equation for the analytic behavior of this correlation function of current as a function of the momenta. Okay, because you have something like p mu j mu has some equals to something. This can be integrated into an experiment about the say the two or the three point function. The anomaly equation then tells you that uh, this this correlation function should have a particular singularity in momentum, which is the, of the type one over p square, that can only come from massless particles. But the hand wavy way of saying it is that if you have gap theory. Uh, and in particular, these correlation functions have uh, a particular uh, behavior as a function of, as you, as you separate them in, in position. That's not something that a, a gap system can give you. But the more precise statement is just that you have a, a singularity in momentum that follows from, from, the, from having an anomaly. We can make an exercise out of that if you want. I mean, uh, one exercise you can do is to take in two dimensions, you have the U1A, you want to be mixed anomaly. Okay, L let me not do another because it's going to take too well to set up the, the, the problem, but yeah. Okay. Sorry? I'm, I'm just talking about here the, the trend with currents. Yeah, I'm talking about just the. the So here is the lemma. If an F is bigger than, so you have a QC theory where the quarks uh, appear with multiplicity two or higher, the, the, such QCD theory is gutless. So you see with almost nothing, we, we've concluded from all the space of QCD theories, if you're interested in fishing for the gap ones, you should look at theories where N alpha, so possibly gap, you need to take N alpha for all your representations to be zero or one. Okay, so that, that's a statement for the continuous symmetry and for a discrete symmetry, which will be relevant at various points, the lectures, hopefully. Yes. Flavor anomaly. Oh, I do too, yes. Actually, as I was writing this, I was getting confused about this. So there's something not quite right in my logic. Yeah, you're saying that if I have a... Yeah, so you'll, you'll know the answer. Yeah. Yes, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so there, yeah, you do. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now, what happens if, the, if, if it's a discrete symmetry? Uh, then you can always flow to a CFT, which preserves the symmetry. You know, you, you can never, I, I do not know how to ever rule out a scenario where a CFT can saturate any anomaly. So you, 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 this possibility is always there, even for discrete symmetry. You can go to a, uh, a spontaneous symmetry breaking phase. So for a discrete symmetry means is that you want to have domain walls that will carry the anomalies. And then there's a more exotic possibility, but actually, which happens very often, at least in, in, four, in three dimensions. You can have a symmetry preserving gap. Anthropologically ordered. 
that's just a, a mouthful to say a non trivial TQFC. Uh, kind of a non trivial entanglement in some sense. Good. So here, here it's unbroken. Here it's broken. And here it's unbroken. Okay. Actually, it can happen that depending on dimensional symmetries, that some of these possibilities are not available to you. So I'll give me two examples. So in two space time dimensions, uh, uh, possibility one is, is possible, but possibility two is not available because of uh, Coleman, Mer Coleman, uh, Mermin Wagner theorem. That says because of the infrared divergences of Order parameters in two dimensions, a, symmetry, a continuous symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken. And uh, option, the last one, I should have named them. So these three, four, five. Option five tells you that uh, it's not available either because two, two dimensional topological field theories do not have the, the right structure to, to, ca to capture anomalies. Okay. So that's already very powerful. You have a, a if you're in two dimensions, you have a two-dimensional QCD theory that has a tooth anomaly, and we know under which, actually, the, the analysis in two dimensions is a bit different because flavor symmetries are not UNF. They can be, because the minimal spinner is major than a while, the flavor symmetries can be ONF. So there's a slightly different story there, but you, you can conclude immediately that if you have a, a theory with a tooth anomaly, a continuous tooth anomaly, that it will have to flow a CFT. And now your task is to find out whether it is a CFT but what the CFT is. Well, for example, in four dimensions, we, the question whether it flows to a CFT or you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking is a dynamical question and without any further input, we don't know how to continue, essentially. Very good. So if this was a, maybe a bit too abstract, let me give you a couple of examples of the various possibilities and some of them will come back, will, will return to during the lectures. For example, of one, uh, so take in two dimensions, you take two dimensional, uh, the tooth model, SUN with NF Dirac fermions in the fundamental. This theory has a, a tooth anomaly for the flavor symmetry here. So we know because of all this discussion that it has to be a CFT that uh, has the, uh, that saturates that tooth anomaly. And as we will see later on, the statement is that the CFT that does that is the UNF level N WGW conformal field theory. An example of uh, another, okay, this is an example still of one. I wanna give you an example where or G is unbroken, but it's, it's not a CFT. So these are a, a very chiral theory. Take SU5 with a well fermion in the five bar on a 10. Okay, so let's put some indices here. So you have two quarks like this. Now this guy, you, you, may, you may worry that how am I canceling gauge anomalies? But it just happens that the cubic invariant for the five bar and the 10 are opposite to each other. So this theory likely cancels uh, gauge anomalies. Uh, so this theory has the sum of two quarks, uh, but it, it exists an unbroken So classically you have a U1 symmetry that rotates each of the, the flavors. The ABJ anomaly uh, breaks this, tells you that there is an unbroken U1 that acts uh, in this way. These three and, and, and one, the minus one, are essentially what I, I, I discussed before. These are the dinking index of the five bar and the 10. So this is an anomaly free, it's an anomaly free U1. And there is a tooth anomaly for this U1. So that's easy to compute. Essentially it's the sum of the cubic 
of the charges here, okay? So what do we have? We have uh, three square times five from this guy, because I, I have charge three and uh, I have five flavors plus 10 flavors times minus one to the cube. And this is 125, okay? So one scenario, one scenario that's believed to be true, that I, and actually that's an, exa an, an example of confinement, unlike what we discussed there in QCD, where you have confinement without chiral symmetry breaking. Uh, what you can do is you can construct in the infrared a massless spin a half composite Uh, let me write it, psi A, psi B, lambda AB, which has charge five. So it's six minus one is five. And now the anomaly in the infrared is easy to compute. It's the cubic anomaly. So it's five cube, which matches U, I, R. So in this scenario, what you have is that uh, the uh, symmetry is unbroken. So you have confinement and uh, U1 is unbroken. By the way, one thing I, I could have said is that you could say, why, why, didn't, why, why doesn't this happen in QCD? Well, you can prove essentially that if you try to write down massless composites given the NF Dirac fermions, you cannot, you cannot saturate the anomalies, essentially. That was essentially done by tooth. So th this scenario cannot occur in QCD, essentially. Sorry? Yes, thank you. Uh, just sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, so maybe, yes, uh, I guess I'll stop here. Uh, and I don't know if next time I'll continue with this or I'll just move to a different topic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great lecture. Uh, uh, questions? Yes. Can you have like combinations of these two, like a disconnected, uh, both of bosons on some disconnected space where related by the street symmetry breaking? Combination, uh, of, combination of spontaneous symmetry breaking and like CFR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Sure. Okay, let's take a coffee break and uh, we'll be back at.